Hey, welcome back to the channel. It is time for our second read along, episode two of The Wide Carnivorous Sky and Other Monstrosities by John Langan. And we are going to cover Technicolor today. Give you my thoughts, um, what I liked, what I didn't like. And I'd love to hear your comments if you read along with us. If you did not, um, well, I'm a day late, so you had you had some time to catch up. So let us switch to the uh, book view here. And, and I highlighted the very first line here because this is actually the final line in The Mask of Red Death. And I actually read that story once I finished Technicolor, wondering if it would give me any more insight into what was going on here. But if you did not read it, I do not think you need to. Uh, John Langan gave you all of the information you need uh, within the story itself and, and his whole take on it. So I don't feel like you're missing anything, but uh, come on, say it out loud with me. And darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. So that is, like I said, the final line of The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. I thought it was going to be the opening line, but not because this actually carries back to uh, the fact that this thing is sort of a story within a story within a story. And so... I think my favorite thing about this, and, and like I said, John John Langan is is really demonstrating his ability to tell uh, stories d in different ways, right? Um, I am I have to confess I am very anxious to get to one of his tales that is that is more in a standard third person or first person POV, just to see how that feels. Because as we know that the last story we read was in kind of a play format. This one is in uh, a second person, I guess, uh, where we have someone addressing us as we're part of this this classroom. But it's cool. It, it ha I think it has an interesting effect because you feel like you're uh, getting all of this information dumped on you. It does feel like you're sitting in a class, but he does something interesting here where what he does is he makes it feel like a dialogue or a conversation without showing the responses or the questions from the rest of the class. Everything is implied based on what you see here. So for instance, he gets right in here uh, when he's asking, uh, of course, you all know what a mask is. If you didn't, you looked it up in your dictionaries because that's what you do in a senior seminar. Anyone? And he respond, responds, no, not a play, not exactly. Yes, good, okay, a masquerade is one sense of the word, a ball whose guests attend in costume, anyone else. And so I, I thought this was kind of, interesting way to do it I, i've tried to do this in some of my own work not this specifically but kind of like when we were talking about the last story where we saw action demonstrated through dialogue and i thought that was a really cool thing rather than having it in narration but i know i'm getting kind of nerdy in the weeds here but I, I i thought that was a really cool uh way and it stood out to me and and it's another one i'm you know taking a mental note on for the future when i work on my own stuff um i i took some notes here i don't remember uh oh yeah this is what i was just talking about you know cool interjections to make it feel like class meaning there's no responses but you you kind of understand what they're asking based on the responses of the um, the professor. And as you know, we, we go into this uh, this literary analysis of The Mask of the Red Death very deeply, I might add. Now, I've never gone to a literary criticism or analysis class when I went to university, but whatever John Lang is doing here and whatever background his may be, he is, he's very convincing on that front. He It almost feels as if he has really deconstructed this story on his own and then you know weaved it into his, his own concoction but as we move on we learn that there is a um, a man named prosper some some character who uh, allegedly was part of the the napoleon army and he he left trekking across russia to die essentially which was which was kind of funny because it brought up a conversation in the discord where um somebody posted a link in there of i think it was called like walking corpse syndrome which is somebody who thinks they're dead because there's a great line in here where uh, he's talking about that he knew he was dead. He knew, he didn't think he was in some kind of frozen hell or some afterlife. He just knew he was dead and on earth still, which is kind of an interesting concept and one that apparently is, is a real thing. And so I thought that was a cool little thing that, that was discovered on the Discord. And then we move on to uh, something that this Prosper was discovering in this abbey. And he's talking about transumption. It's a term from classical rhetoric. It refers to the elision of a chain of associations sorry sometimes i like to watch your heads explode i love those little interjections there um there it, it's kind of a nice moment of levity of, of comic relief i think uh in a tale that, that definitely spirals down into something uh far more dark and here we find ourselves. uh like i said there was a story within a story within a story the first story being the story we're part of, we're being lectured to, the second story being the story of Prosper, who is trying to do some kind of a strange, magical kind of experiment. And then the third story is how it relates to Poe. 
And this is where we get into that. Obviously, we're cycling through the seven rooms from the Mask of the Red Death. Uh, he's arguing that Edgar takes their colors from Prosper's book. And that schema, orange is the center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so he's trying to weave in the, the strange uh, circumstances in which uh, Edgar Allan Poe died. And another cool thing about this story is, is, is like I said, all of the things interwoven and how this, this teacher is explaining it to you. And then, of course, at the end, we know we are part of this experiment. Um, there, there's some strange characters wearing masks um, in the classroom and I believe they exit the classroom and we're looking at these pictures and soon at the very end I, I believe it's even the, the last line of the last paragraph we we figure out okay I see what's going on and I think what was great about that is it, it didn't seem like it just came out of nowhere as I was reading the story I started to feel like wow this this lecture is, seem, is seemingly as obsessed as Prosper was as Poe was in these stories and you know, sure enough, the lecture was because we're part of the experiment or the class is part of the experiment. And I think that's a really good thing to note about John Langan's skill as a writer is that um, he, nothing felt sort of uh, as a complete surprise. It felt like it was building towards this thing. And I think if I were to read this in one sitting, which I did not, it'd be even more apparent where you see the writing become more and more and more twisted, almost uh, maddening as, as, as this lecture is becoming just completely infatuated with the words he or she is, is saying and, and getting excited even, you know, for what is to come because we don't know what's going to happen but um the lecture does and here is sort of the the description of what's happening here we want to know what happens when uh prosper took the members of the salon uh took into the parisian catacombs and so this is what the description was suppose that the real what we take to be the real imagine that world outside of the self all this out here is like a kind of writing we write it together we're continuously writing it together onto the surface of things, the paper, as it were. It isn't something we do consciously or that we exercise any conscious control over. We might glimpse it in moments of extremity as Vogelé, I think that's how you say it, did. But that's about as close to it and most of us will come. What if though, what if it were possible to do something more then simply look. What if you could clear a space on that paper and write something else? What might you bring into being? And then here Edgar Allan Poe tries to find out. Long after the mask, which is much caution as it is a field guide, he decides to apply Prosper's ideas for real. He does so during that famous last week at the end of his life, that gap in the biographical record that has prompted so much speculation. And so John Langan, as we know, uses this to his advantage and weaves the tale himself, explains what it is. And it's funny, looking at this again, you can just see the layers. You can see that uh, John Langan is giving us hints as what's going to come, which is our participation in this uh, twisted experiment. And I thought this was cool, this section. I, I, hi I highlighted this because when you're writing books and you, and you, you try to think about, okay, what's something plausible? And I don't even know. I didn't even look this up. I think that's what's so convincing about uh, uh, John Langan's writing is that he convinces me. I, I don't need to like fact check him or anything um it is fiction of course so it, it's not it doesn't matter either way but i thought it was interesting how they were explaining that during the examination of his remains he noted that his brain was shrunken and hard anyone who knows about these things will tell you that the brain is one of the first organs to decay which means that those investigators found a rattling around in Edgar's cranium, which was cancer. And so that leads to Edgar, and he's in a pretty bad way, he's having trouble controlling his movements of his body, his speech. Half the time he seems drunk, he's stone cold sober. And so I, I just love the way that, that he sort of created a meaning or, or an explanation out of Ed, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, mysterious death at the end of his life. Because when would death occur? I don't know why I said that. Ah, here it was, I, I lost it earlier, but he is uh, performing the great work. At least that's what Prosper was trying to do. Edgar Allan Poe, in turn, after him. The whole idea of the great work, of the transumption, is to draw one of the powers that our constant collective writing of the real consigns to abstraction across the barrier into physicality. Yeah, it's getting deep here, guys. And here we are at the final bit of the story when we discover that we are part of it. We are part of this experiment. Look at, look in the air. Can you see it? I will give to darkness a dominion more complete than it has known since it was split asunder. Beautiful writing. I, I, I love the story. I thought it was extremely clever. I'd really like to know more backstory around this, like how much research John Langan had to do 
or if this is part of his background. I don't know if he's like a classically trained literary analysis or anything like that. Um, in any case, he fooled me if he was not. I, I thought it was a, a very believable story uh, from the perspective of this character. And as we know, we get this, we get the title name Technicolor for when the lecturer is talking about the, the films that were made of Poe's work, uh, like starring Vincent Price, who's one of my favorite old horror actors. But anyway, I enjoyed this one. Um, I enjoyed all the layers of it. Um, it kind of kept my attention, even though it's, it did feel info dumpy quite a bit because it's someone telling you a story. However, I, I think toward the Poe part of it, it feels more like immediate action. It feels like you can really see it unfolding before your eyes. Uh, so I, n I never felt like I was bored in this whatsoever. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm just completely in love right now with, with John Langan's writing. And I can't wait to start the next tale, which is going to be the title of this collection, which is right here, The Wide Carnivorous Sky. So let me know what you thought in the comments. Is there something I missed that you would like to discuss further? Because I would love to talk to you about it. Um, or join over my Discord where we have a channel specifically dedicated to this. Everybody's been cool about no spoilers, uh, you know, up until where we're reading to. So don't worry about that. Um, but for next week, it is time to read the title story of this collection, The Wide Carnivorous Sky. If I am moving too quickly for you, please let me know in the comments. I am more than happy to slow down. We can start dividing these things up. And I know toward the end, there's going to be a novella that we'll probably have to cut in two or three. I still don't know how long it is, but I think this is going to be good enough for a week's worth of reading. But anyway, I'm enjoying reading this along with you guys. Um, I'd love to see your comments and love to see what you think about the book so far. On that note, I will see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.